Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Fabian Bornstein, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the NHA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to our last Food for Thought lecture of the fall, sadness. Uh, it's featuring our NHA research fellow, Barbara White, rescheduled from a few weeks ago, talking about Cyrus Purse. Uh, as always, we want to thank you for supporting this free community program. It happens every week in the fall and spring. It's made possible in part by the um, MS Worthington Foundation and receives media support from Novation Media. Uh, before we get started, if you could take a second to silence or otherwise turn off your cell phone so it doesn't disrupt the presentation, that would be tremendously helpful. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our speaker today. Barbara White holds a master's degree from Boston University in African American Studies, as well as a master's degree in Educational Administration from the University of Lancaster in England. For 33 years, Barbara was a teacher at Nantucket Public Schools, teaching in both the high school and the middle school, before retiring in June 2004. Throughout her career, Barbara has focused her energies on researching the African American history of Nantucket, and in 1978, she received a Rockefeller Foundation scholarship to fund her research, and more recently has become one of our own NHA Research Fellows. In 2002, Barbara received an award for her work in African American history from the Museum of African American History in Boston. She's published frequently on Nantucket history of various topics, including contributions to the collection Nantucket's People of Color and a book called Line in the Sand, The Battle to Integrate Nantucket's Public Schools, written with Fran Cartoonan. Her main project since retiring, however, has been to research the life of Cyrus Purse, the first principal of Nantucket High School and the man for whom the middle school is now named. The results of all this work is 10 years of work, <laughs> is the Live to the Truth, The Life and Times of Cyrus Purse, which is her book, we're going to have a book signing and uh, book purchasing, purchasing and signing available right in the candle factory after this. But for now, Barbara's going to give us a little preview of the book. So please join me in welcoming Barbara. <laughs> well, first of all, let me thank the NHA for their flexibility in rescheduling this talk, which I had to cancel due to the death of my mother. My topic today is Cyrus Purse as a radical thinker. Many of you know some key facts about his life from previous talks I've given, so I'm not going to talk about him today in chronological order. And I will skip over some of the really interesting episodes in his life because I've talked about them before. Hopefully you'll, you'll buy my book and read about them. Today we'll focus on how ahead of his time Purse was, how principled he was, and hopefully impress upon you how significant a contribution he made to the world of education on par with his best friend, the famous Horace Mann. I believe Purse should be as famous. Live to the truth, live to the truth. It was the way that Cyrus Purse ended his lessons every day. It is still the motto of Framingham State University, which was founded by Purse. Today, the phrase sounds awkward and a bit archaic. We'd be more likely to say today, live for the truth or live by the truth, but Two implies action. It implies forward movement and progress. And that's what Peirce meant and how he lived. He was not saying that truth is easily attained, nor is truth always static. People have to lean in and to push toward it. Uh, these were not idle words to Peirce. It's what he lived by and what he encouraged his students to live by. At first glance, Peirce is, I have to keep looking to make sure Mark's paying attention. Um, He's my sidekick. On a family farm in Waltham does not seem the kind of upbringing that would spawn radical thinking. However, young Cyrus was brought up on the ideals of the American Revolution and the philosophy of the Enlightenment. His father, his great, his grandfather and great uncle fought at the battles of Lexington and Bunker Hill, and they were committed to com creating a revolutionary democracy. Furthermore, the Purse family had a long and distinguished tradition of public service, serving in Waltham and in surrounding communities in numerous positions. You can't understand Purse or the other radical reformers of his era without understanding the importance of the emergence of Unitarianism. Unitarianism grew out of a faction within the Congregational Church. While the Purses were longtime members of their local Congregational Church, they were also exposed to the new and radical philosophy. Samuel Ripley, considered by some to be the first Unitarian minister in the United States, was ordained at the Purse Family Church in Waltham in 1806. 
the year that young Peirce, age 16, entered Harvard. That, that his father Isaac remained as a deacon at the church indicates that he was an early supporter of Unitarian-leaning faction of the Congregationalists. And the fact that they sent their son to Harvard, then firmly in the hands of a Unitarian-leaning faculty, is evidence enough that the family was comfortable with Unitarian thinking. The Unitarians did not officially splinter from the established church in Massachusetts until 1825, but the movement had been growing since the turn of the century, and by the 19, 1820s, fully one-third of the congregational churches in Massachusetts had Unitarian-leaning ministers. The Unitarians questioned the Puritan notion of an angry and punitive God. They questioned the idea of the Trinity, believing instead in one unitary God. They challenged the concept that all people are born with the stain of original sin and doubted the accepted belief in eternal damnation, skeptical that God would condemn people to everlasting hell and save only a few elect. The most radical Unitarians even questioned the divinity of Jesus Christ, speculating that he was immortal. This belief was considered especially heretical as it called into question the literal truth of the New Testament upon which Christianity is based. Unitarians rejected the belief in the depravity of man. Their view of man and of God was optimistic. And it was this optimism that empowered them to take an active role in their own fate and in the fate of society. It is why Unitarians are disproportionately represented in the leadership of the many reform groups of the era, including the Transcendentalists. Peirce was criticized throughout his entire life for supporting what some called his Unitarian agenda. One of the first radical movements that Peirce supported was the most extreme form of temperance, total abstinence from alcohol. Moderate temperance groups supported alcohol for medicinal use and towns across the state had doctors licensed to dispense it. But Peirce opposed even that's use, and it was a position from which he never wavered. He was a total teetotaler. Peirce was also an ardent advocate of women's rights decades before organized groups existed for women's rights. As early as 1815, he opened a private school on Nantucket where boys and girls sat side by side and learned the same curriculum. It is another position from which he never wavered. In 1816, he married Nantucketer Harriet Coffin Purse, who was his strong and competent partner through his life. She taught by his side. Although Purse studied for the ministry as an undergraduate at Harvard and as a postgraduate at Harvard's Divinity Department, it hadn't become a separate school yet, he only served as a minister for one period in his life. In that one stint as a preacher, Peirce delivered an important sermon on Christmas Day in his church in North Reading. In 1824, this sermon laid out his radical agenda. Only two copies of it exist now, one at Colby College and one at Yale. In his sermon, Peirce called for, quote, improved condition of the female sex. He said that while women made up of half the human race, they were not valued as much as men. He preached that women needed to be valued as much more than, quote, pure maidens and faithful wives, but also as thinkers and students. Mind you, this was more than 20 years before the Seneca Falls Convention, which is often seen as the debut of the women's movement. Incidentally, Peirce was eventually asked to resign from his church in North Reading due to his being so out of sync with the majority of his more conservative parishioners. It is an example of Peirce putting his principles in action, and it won't be the first time that he either resigned or was forced to resign because of his beliefs. Throughout his life, Peirce was a fierce advocate of equal pay for women teachers. He recognized that women were just as capable of men at teaching high school, not just teaching the younger children, as many people thought. He recognized that women could be school administrators. The majority of Peirce's assistants at the normal schools where he taught were women, including a woman named Electa Lincoln, and we've never found a photo of her. But Electa Lincoln took over Peirce's job as the school's director in West Newton after his retirement, in essence making her the first director of a normal school, 
which was the name for the teacher training schools, which later were called teacher's colleges, which form the basis of many of our great institutions today. Another truth to which Peirce lived was the most extreme form of nonviolent resistance, doubting its use even in self-defense. He was an early member of the Massachusetts Peace Society, led by fellow Unitarian Nor Noah Worcester. Peirce's radical 1824 sermon called for an end to warfare, urging swords to be turned into plowshares. In the NHA files is a letter Peirce wrote in 1839 to his former Nantucket High School students, which touched upon the subject. He admitted his misgivings to them, even about the American Revolution. Quote, to be candid, I think our forefathers ought not to have resisted unto blood. They should have endured until God had pointed out some other way for their deliverance. A radical stance. Knowing how important pacifism was to Peirce, Horace Mann solicited money when Peirce retired to enable him to attend the International Peace Conference in Paris in 1849. Incidentally, one of the contributors to that was our own Nathaniel Barney. They had served together on an integrationist school committee. Going to the Peace Conference was a trip of the lifetime for the 59-year-old Peirce who had never left the country. He traveled with 23 delegates from Massachusetts, stopping first in England and then joining hundreds of other delegates to cross the channel. The conference took place over three thrilling days with over 2,000 people in attendance and presided over by Victor Hugo. On the second day of the conference, the importance of public education was center stage, and Massachusetts was singled out as the only place in the world where public education was supported by direct and proportional taxation. It is no surprise that Peirce was also an abolitionist. What may be a surprise was how early he came to that position. He laid out his abolitionism again in the 1824 sermon, almost a full decade before William Lloyd Garrison created the Anti-Slavery Society of which Peirce eventually became a member and an officer. The most important event of Peirce's abolitionist experience was in the 1840s when abolitionists across the state rallied in support of George and Rebecca Latimer, two captured um, fugitives from slavery who were in jeopardy of being returned to the South. The Latimer petition successfully altered Massachusetts law prohibiting law enforcement and court officials from aiding and abetting those trying to re-enslave people. But the abolitionists quickly realized that the new law did nothing to help fl slaves who didn't flee to Massachusetts, nor did it do anything to disrupt the stranglehold of power that the slaveholding states had in Congress due to the three-fifths compromise, which allowed slaves to be counted as three-fifths of a person for representation in the House of Representatives. So, abolitionists across Massachusetts mobilized to gather signatures on a new petition, one that would negate the three-fifths compromise. Peirce was chosen to deliver the gigantic petition of over 51,000 names to Washington, D.C., where he met with former president and Massachusetts representative John Quincy Adams. The abolitionists knew that their petition was doomed due to the infamous gag rule that prohibited all petitions referring to slavery from even being presented to Congress. However, with a Massachusetts representative, alongs a representative alongside him, Peirce carried the huge petition to the floor of the House. He had had it fitted up into a large, on a large revolving contraption. He wrote that they placed it, quote, on Mr. Adams' table. It was unrolled almost half a mile in length. It nearly hid Mr. A from the view of the whole House, so that in order to be seen and heard, he was obliged to step out from behind it. For four days, Adams tried to get the petition considered. Peirce wrote, how the sight of that big roll did make those Philistines of the South rage and foam and stamp and gnash their teeth. As expected, the petition never was considered. And Peirce wrote, it was taken off its rollers and laid in a great unsightly bundle on the speaker's desk to be disposed of as he thinks proper. This is a piece of the petition that Mark found when we were in the National Archives amidst boxes and boxes of unfiled petitions. So it's still not filed and it's in bits. Years ago, when I was researching the story of Nantucket's battle to integrate the public schools, I had found evidence of Peirce's involvement on the side of integration, but then he disappeared. And I was puzzled and then he, would re he reappeared several years later, uh, in fact serving as the principal of an integrated grammar school and resigning in protest when Nantucket's town meeting 
voted to resegregate. And when I retired, I decided I would solve this puzzle. And actually also encouraged by Fran, who decided we were going to do a project for the Nantucket Public Schools. So I began searching out Purse and to find out where had he been. Of course, what I found out was that he had disappeared because he had been tapped by Horace Mann to become director of the Lexington Normal School, the first public teacher training school in the nation. It was during a hiatus from the Normal School that he had returned to the island in time to become embroiled, embroiled in the school integration controversy swirling over the African school. The puzzle solved. But what I found out about the battles over the normal school encouraged me to keep researching, and that's why it took me so long to get a book out. At any rate, when Peirce did become co-principal of the West Newton English and Classical School, the last school in which he taught, it was an integrated co-educational boarding school. So Peirce was a radical abolitionist, integrationist, feminist, pacifist, and temperance leader. However, the most radical stances that Purses took were in the form of educational reform. His innovations were many and varied and far too long today to describe. During Purses time, almost anyone could be a teacher, with the huge exception of married women, who were barred from teaching, eliminating a huge pool of potential candidates. Teaching was a low status profession and paid poorly. Too many were itinerant men, incapable of finding other work, often drunkards. Young women, teenagers, were often hired, but they mostly left because they got married. There were rare, unmarried, dedicated women, but not nearly enough to form a professional teaching corps. There was little impetus for towns to fund schools. The well-to-do sent their children to good private schools, such as Hepzibah Hussies on this slide. There we go. Um, as well as the Coffin School. The prevailing attitude was that the children of the poor didn't really need to be educated for laboring jobs such as those on board whaling ships. These public, thus, public schools were underfunded and haphazard, many meeting only for a few weeks in the summer and a few weeks in the winter. Schools were uncomfortable, poorly ventilated, poorly heated. Furthermore, the Puritan philosophy supported the notion that these conditions were character building. Not, not surprisingly, Discipline was based on corporal punishment, and it was often brutal. Maintaining discipline over unruly older boys was a justification to hire burly men to take care of them, and it was thought they were the only ones capable of keeping order. Reading through early records of early schools, it is not uncommon for, to find that some schools ended early in the term because the students had taken over the school and driven the teachers out. Peirce and the other progressive reformers attempted to change all of that. For one, Peirce and his fellows were believers in phrenology, a new science that studied the relationship between a person's character and the morphology of the skull. It's now discredited, um, and Tim Lepre always likes to tease me that, you know, that Cyrus Peirce, he was a phrenologist. But many beliefs of the phrenologists are now accepted. Phrenologists believed, for example, that children needed fresh air, cleanliness, good food, warmth, and exercise. Since children who lacked access to those could not develop intellectually, the phrenologists believed schools should be designed to incorporate as many as those of those elements as possible. Who can argue with that? The beliefs of the phrenologists led to more humane treatment of those in prison, the deaf, the blind, the insane, and the disabled. Besides man and purse, Dorothea Dix, who championed for the rights of prisoners, and Samuel Gridley Howe, who opened the famous Perkins School for the Blind, were also leading phrenologists. They were radical ideas which clashed with those who believed that such afflictions were God's punishment. On Nantucket, Peirce was an officer in the local education society that advocated that Nantucket improve its public schools and create a public high school. And when they succeeded, Peirce became the high school's first principal a position he held for only one year because that was when Mann asked him to go head the Lexington Normal School. The first normal school being located in Lexington, was a, the significance of the site was not lost on Mann and Purse, who believed that education was possibly more necessary than the American Revolution in preserving democracy. 
Although it got off to a shaky start when it opened in 1839, by the end of the first year, the school had graduated 25 young women, the first professionally trained teachers in the United States. Among them were two Nantucketers, Mary Swift and Susan Burdick. Both went on to successful careers. The success of the school eventually gave rise to dozens and dozens of teacher colleges across the nation, all based on the common curriculum designed by Peirce. It is not a stretch to claim that Peirce is responsible for the professionalization of teaching and responsible for the vast improvement of teaching across the country. Peirce's curriculum focused on subject content as well as on what Peirce called the science of teaching, a new phrase, the first classes in teaching methodology. Emphasis was on critical thinking and the development of relationships between students and teachers. Peirce was true to his ideal of all teaching being child-centered. At the core was a deep belief in the importance of moral education. Samuel Gridley Howe wrote of Peirce's school, the system of instruction is truly philosophical because it is based on the principle that young minds hunger and thirst for knowledge as the body does for food because it makes the student not merely the recipients of knowledge but calls all their faculties into operation to attain it for themselves. This lofty notion was a far cry from the schools of the era where teachers dispense knowledge without question and to passive students. Within weeks of opening the Lexington Normal School, Peirce also opened what he called the Model School, a school made up of the town of Lexington's children, a school in which the prospective teachers, which they called Normalites, could practice on real kids. Thus, Peirce created the first student teaching, now an accepted practice but radical for the time. Peirce also contributed to statewide teacher seminars for those teachers who didn't have the opportunity to ever attend a normal school, and he wrote detailed and practical hands-on lesson plans, many of them, in the teacher's journal that was started by Horace Mann. There's pages and pages of lesson plans, many of them pretty good for today. Peirce was a fierce opponent of corporal punishment. He believed that interesting, engaging lessons would solve the problem of school discipline. His controversial stance got him into trouble with established teachers who believed that hitting children was vital to their teaching. In 1843, a group of well-respected schoolmasters in Boston challenged Peirce's position in a 150-page pamphlet, setting off an intense debate that made headlines for two years. The schoolmasters defended corporal punishment as well as rote memorization, another practice of which Peirce disapproved. The masters also criticized the new technology promoted by person man, such as globes and blackboards, labeling them as distracting gimmicks. We hear these things today, I'm sure. Uh, the masters claimed that the best motivator of children was fear. Besides the schoolmasters, other powerful forces set their sights on purse and the normal school movement. In the first year, a group of men on the Board of Education under Horace Mann attempted to close the first normal school, arguing that the state had no business in education, believing it to be the sole domain of local communities. Fortunately, Mann persuaded the legislature to continue the normal school experiment and to even create two more normal schools, one in Barrie, which is now Westfield, and one in Bridgewater. Peirce believed in a well-rounded curriculum. He believed that the arts, such as music and drawing, were as important as the so-called academics. He was an early supporter of the use of drama in school. And I made a note here to tell you that the high school opens a play tonight. <laughs> and it runs through the weekend, so please support drama like Peirce would have. Um, so, back. In fact, the most serious attack on the normal school came in the mid-1840s when conservatives attacked the normal school students for presenting dramatic tableau where girls dressed in costumes and even portrayed men. That attack was played out in the headlines of the Boston press for two more years, eventually prompting a legislative investigation into Peirce. Peirce was eventually exonerated but the toll on him was immense and led to his retirement from the normal school, which had moved from Lexington to West Newton by then. It's a really good story about the attack on Peirce, but I'm not going to talk about it today because I've talked about it before. 
Peirce believed that education could be rigorous and still be fun. In fact, it was imperative that school be fun and enjoyable, another position that prompted criticism of his methods. His normal school students in their journals recalled a lot of laughter with their beloved Father Peirce. Just calling him Father conveys the importance of the warm personal relationships that Peirce believed were necessary to be part of good teaching. Peirce believed in the importance of daily physical exercise. Peirce's students took hikes and went boating and sledding. At the private West Newton English and Classical School where he taught before his death, his students were among the first to try a newly invented roller skate. That school had a bowling alley, a gymnasium, a ballpark, a stage, and a pond for swimming. That school also permitted dancing. And these practices were made fodder for those who found such activities scandalous and time consuming and wasting. Peirce believed in hands-on learning whenever possible. His students took field trips to museums, historical sites, they went into Harvard for lectures. They examined rocks and plants and animals. In the West Newton English and Classical School, such a mouthful, uh, the students were expected to help in the garden and take care of animals. It was at that last school that Peirce was able to fully implement his radical philosophy and practices. The boarding school was opened in 1854 with his protege and young friend, Nathaniel Allen. A private school, uh, it's being renovated now, that building, by the way, um, in Newton. The boarding school was, um, let's see, a private school it was out from the oversight of the legislature or school committees, a great relief to Peirce in his ending years. Uh, Mark found a letter that said that he loved to sit in the back of the classroom, even as, as he was really too old to teach and just to enjoy being there. That school was diverse from its beginning. 36% of the students were female the first year, and from the outset, black students were part of the student body. As the school's fame grew, it also attracted students from overseas. This slide, not that one, next one, which I'm not gonna read you, it's far too long, but if you just glance through it as I'm talking, is a lovely summary of, in Peirce's words about what he had expected to achieve in his life and what he dedicated his life to, and it's, it's, it's a favorite of ours. If Peirce were alive today, he'd be alarmed at some of the issues plaguing our schools. He would oppose the charter schools and school vouchers because they take public resources away from public education. He would be pleased that teacher training now requires a college degree, happy that teaching is now recognized as a profession but he would be dismayed that teachers still make less than other professions that require as much schooling, and he'd be sad that the teacher's status is still low. Uh, there's a lot of teachers in the audience. What, one of us hasn't heard the phrase, if you can't, teach. So insulting. He would be upset at the cuts that school committees often make that hit the arts and physical education harder than the academic subjects because Pierce saw them as equally important. He'd be alarmed at the disconnect between administrators and hands-on teaching. Today, few principals in our country teach, even at his busiest in Lexington, where he was even responsible for shoveling the sidewalks, he never gave up the classroom. It was always his greatest joy. Peirce would not approve of or understand the testing mania that has swept our country and would think it a colossal waste of time and money to waste hours and hours testing and test preparation, all activities that take away from true teaching. Nor would he approve of the accountability movement that holds teachers responsible for the progress of their students as if we can measure them by an arbitrary checklist. He did not believe in a one-size-fits-all mentality and did not believe that students learn at a specific pace. They might learn to read six months after someone else. He would be disturbed at the underfunded, understaffed, and overcrowded schools of our inner cities which serve a diverse population and would wonder why, despite the trend to standardize tests and texts, that we haven't standardized the, the way that schools are funded so that we would have an equal dispersion of funds. We're so concerned with standardizing everything else. Peirce would remind us that as public education goes, so goes the country. To paraphrase what he and others wrote in an 1838 address to the town of Nantucket, quote, Every patriot must be a friend of, the, of public education and of the system of free schools. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, if you're available, we'd like to take some questions from the audience. Just raise your hand and I'll run around with the microphone. Yes, he was born in 1790 and he died in 1860, just, just before the Civil War broke out, which, you know, he saw coming, clearly, but was, would have been just horrified at the bloodshed. Yes? Yeah. And um, they, it, he had a hearing, and there was a lot of response to it, negative from the South and so forth, understandably. But why wasn't, wh why wasn't there any action taken on it? Was it just they, ignored? Or? They, in 1836, the House had passed the gag rule, and right. so they weren't allowed to present it. And John Quincy Adams kept trying to do tactics that would get it. He made several motions to try to get it put into the record. And oh. he, and even even the day that they took it away, he was still trying to go to the records office and try to get it, you know, submitted. And I had been in contact with the library to see if it existed anymore. And they didn't. It's not even in the records. Wow. It's 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 it, you had to d really dig yeah. through John Quincy Adams' diary. Uh -huh. He he mentions Purse three times, um, and Purse's letters, and right. other other the the Liberator. Fantastic. Um, well, if you don't mind, one other question. West Newton, English and Classical, you said it was being Such renovated. a long name. What is it, uh, what is it used for they, now? They, well, Historic Newton has just, um, is, is working on, they have a big grant to, okay. I don't know what they're eventually going to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, we're going up there to speak in a few weeks, so hopefully we'll find out. But that's a whole new story. The, there are journals and journals that they have found in that building that the woman who owned the building wouldn't let any researchers see when I was doing my work, but they're, they should be available in about a year. Oh, good. So they might have more stuff about PERS. Edition number two. Thanks. Yeah. To what extent did your uh, first ideal project stay connected with uh, developments in Europe uh, that had to do with education Very. reform? I, I, sort, I skipped over that today, but um, he... He and Mann and um, a guy named Carter were very involved in um, going to Prussia. Mann actually went to Prussia to see their teacher training schools. And the Coffin School here, which was based on Lancastrian pr principles from England. So all of the things about grading students and putting them in, in progression were all from Europe. And, and in fact, one of the criticisms about that was that the people who tried to um, kill the normal schools called them un-American. So it was another label that Peirce had to struggle with. Um, the, and constantly they were accused of trying to Prussianize American education. And Prussia was a dictatorship, so there were a lot of layers to that criticism. But yeah, they were very... Um, and the phrenologist, George Coombe, was also very influential, and he came over and toured with man. So yeah, they were very influenced by Europe. Fran? I, I just want to make it clear that a line in the sand is entirely Barbara's book. And for some reason, Amazon puts us down as co-authors. But not true. It's Barbara's book. It, but I don't mind sharing the stage with Fran. <laughs> yes? This is a very silly question. No. Having grown up in Nantucket, I, I always thought it was Cyrus Pierce. I wondered how you found out. Well, there's several Pierce. sources that say he pronounced it P-U-R-S-E. And uh, from the e early genealogy, I have a geneal genealogy of the Pierce family history. Their, f their name in Devon was P-E-R-S. And so I think that's where the original came from. And we... we um, we're trying to say Purse because that's how it was. And when we went to Newton, where the other Purse school is, there's only two, one in Newton and one in Nantucket, we stopped a policeman because we got lost. And Mark rolled down the window and said, can you do, direct us to the Pierce school? And the guy looked at him and said, oh, you must mean the Purse school. So, so they get it. <laughs> and I would also say that um, the people I graduated from Nantucket Public Schools with, we were sort of the cusp generation. We still said purse 
and after that, there was a sort of slither into peers. I, I know that um, the principal of the middle school came to one of my lectures at the Meeting House, and he said he's really trying hard to tell the students it's purse now. Okay, do we have one more? All right, well, thank you again so much for speaking with us today. And I hope you'll all join us in the Candle Factory for to take a look at the book, maybe purchase one, get signed by Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.